Good morning. It's great to be in the house of the Lord. Good to see everyone out on this Sunday to hear to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's good to be here at Victory Baptist Church. And good to see everyone out. Uh, just a couple of things to pass along with you, just to be mindful of today. Uh, please remember that uh, if you have a, a student, a, a child, or a youth that is in fifth grade currently, or is um, in 11th grade going into 12th grade for this next year, uh, I'd like to meet with um, all of you after the service uh, today, and we're going to discuss some things about some changes that's coming up with the youth. So uh, just stick around just for a few moments after the service, and it uh, won't take much of your time. just going to explain that a little bit. Also, something else to keep in mind, the Lord's Supper will be the fifth Sunday of this month, and also the end of the year... Awana Awards Night will be May the 10th. That's at 6 p.m. It'll be in the sanctuary on a Wednesday night. So please come out and support the kids and all that they have done, all that they've put forward, and also all the workers, everything that they've done. Uh, so remember all this. That'll be coming up um, soon. It's crazy to think May's here and it's right around the corner. And also, uh, the Sunday before that, May the 7th, we're going to be recognizing all of our graduates from high school, also from college, if we have any of those. Uh, so if you have uh, a student that is graduating, please get their info into the office, uh, all the details, a picture, please, if at all possible. Uh, we'd like to recognize them that Sunday morning, so uh, keep that in mind as well. Also, in your bulletin there, you'll see that we need to circle this date, July the 16th to the 21st. That's Vacation Bible School. It will be here before we know it. And so let's be praying about that, praying, thanking God in advance for what He's going to do in and through this with the workers, the kids that will be involved. Uh, so a lot to be uh, mindful of this morning. What's well, good to be here, and uh, I'm just thankful today to say that I am saved, aren't you? Amen. Thankful today to know that we have a Savior that lives. We've talked about that for the last two weeks, and that doesn't change this morning because every Sunday we come together it recognizes and we know for a fact that Jesus is alive. Amen. And uh, so thankful, thankful for that. Let's go ahead and let's start with a time of prayer and then we'll let our choir come and just lead us into a time in our service. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this privilege to be here today. Thank you, Father, for all you do. Thank you for your love, your grace, your faithfulness. Father, we pray today as we worship that we will give it our best, that we will exalt your name upon high. We also pray here in a short while for your messenger. I pray today that I will be able to speak boldly and share what needs to be heard. We love you. We praise you. Thank you once again for all you do. And we ask all this in the name above every name, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. But do 
stand with us as we turn to page 467 when we all get to heaven.
Amen. If you would, turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 18 through 20. While you're doing that, if you wouldn't mind, stand with me this morning as we honor the reading of God's Word. Start verse 18. Paul writing, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this privilege to be here today. Thank you, Father, for the time that we've been able to enter into the, wor- or the worship uh, and praise with you as we've entered the throne room. And Father, also for this period of time here today, I pray you'd use me, speak through me, help me today, O oh God. We love you, we praise you, we thank you for all you do. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Paul warns here in this passage of Scripture about becoming shipwrecked spiritually. Uh, Every Christian, everybody that's here today is engaged in this warfare. To win this war, it is necessary for us to, what, hold the faith and maintain what Paul speaks of here of a good conscience. Hold the faith. Christians wind up with shipwrecked lives when they have rejected the faith and defiled their own conscious, when they look to other areas of life, when they look to other answers for solutions in their life. And Paul knew something about being shipwrecked, obviously. He himself had been shipwrecked three times in his own personal life. 2 Corinthians 11, verse number 25 tells us here, Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. Imagine what that was like just for a moment. Those were not comfortable situations there for the Apostle Paul. He faced a lot of troubling times, a lot of heartache, a lot of difficult times. You know, talking about shipwreck in lives, many lives can end up in shipwrecks. Many ministries can end up in shipwrecks. Many marriages can end up being shipwrecked. Many young people's lives, if they choose to go a different direction of what God has called them to go towards, can end up shipwrecked. However, many shipwrecks could have been avoided. When the Lord is at the helm of your life, you need not ever fear a spiritual shipwreck. But you know what causes the shipwreck in our life? is when we take the helm when we think that we have all the answers, when we try to figure it out on our own, that's where we find shipwreck that occurs in our life. Now this sermon today is going to be just a little different. It's going to be a little unique. And this is going to be more of an object lesson as we look at something that happened in the history of our world when it also pertains to a shipwreck. The most famous shipwreck of all The sinking of the Titanic. Now, yesterday uh, was the 111th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic vessel. On the night of April the 14th, 1912, at 11.40 p.m., the Titanic struck an iceberg. Now, this doesn't surprise anybody. Everybody knows. We've watched the movie. We've seen where... Jack and Rose have their love relationship, which is very fabricated. That didn't actually happen. We all know that James Cameron actually solved how that he thought that Rose, it's been talked about for years, how Rose could have pulled Jack up on that board and they could have all saved. He actually put that to the test. Not recently, because so many people have been critical of that movie, which is a really good movie pertaining to the actual historicity of the movie itself. But with that being said, none of that actually happened. That just makes for good viewing and popcorn munchers and good movie content. 
But on the night of April the 14th, 1912, at 11.40 p.m., the greatest maritime disaster in the history began to unfold. The Titanic struck that iceberg, and then into the early morning hours of April the 15th, 1912, the Titanic officially sank to the bottom of the Atlantic. The scripture tells us and calls us to remember, according to Deuteronomy 32, verse number 7, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. The Bible tells us that we're to remember and learn from the past. We're to learn from mistakes that we make in the past. We're to learn from all these things that happen. Now the story of Titanic has been told numerous times. It has had many thousands upon thousands upon thousands of books that have been written, that have been done to actually talk about the story, many different lives that were there upon that ship and how everyone was affected by that. But see, the Titanic set sail on its maiden voyage from Southampton, England on... April the 10th, 1912. Oh, they boarded the ship and it was headed where? It was headed to New York. It was headed to a place many people were on this ship. You had the most luxurious people that had a lot more money than I can ever imagine to have. Then you had your second class that were okay in society at that time. Then you had the third class. And many have written that where, where they slept, they actually... He had another bed down on that lower level for the rats to sleep with as well. So if you got on the Titanic, you were a blessed, fortunate individual. But think about this ship just for a moment. It was 900 feet long. It carried 6,000 tons of coal for its 29 boilers with three smokestacks 60 inch feet high and 24 feet in circumference. Its boilers provided steam that drove its three propellers at 175 RPMs. Its engines generated about 30,000 horsepower. Now we know there were four smokestacks. One of the smokestacks was actually there just for looks. So it would make the ship look longer. It weighed almost 50,000 tons. That's a lot. It struck the famous iceberg, as we know, at 1140 on the evening of April the 14th. And it took two hours and 40 minutes to sink. That big old ship went down pretty quick. There were 2,222 people that were believed to have been on board. And I know sometimes we see numbers. Those numbers vary because it was so long ago and records were not as accurate as we have them today. There were only 20 lifeboats that could only accommodate 1,178 people that were on board. But only 706 made it into those lifeboats. Lifeboats for 53% of the occupancy. 32% survived. The lifeboats were almost 40% empty when they arrived on the Carpathia, when it was rescued. So 1,516 people perished in an icy, watery grave those early morning hours of April the 15th, 1912. And all of those people, when they left Southampton, were never expecting that they were going to be stepping into an eternity on that morning hour. 1,516, they all stepped into eternity in those icy, watery graves. But why was it a tragedy? That's a lot to talk about. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Titanic too as we go on in the sermon. But why was it a tragedy? It was not such a tragedy because so many people died. That was sad. Yes, it is. It's a tragedy. Can you imagine just for a moment news coming back to families and news doesn't travel like it does today. We don't get instantaneous messages on Instagram or Facebook Messenger. It took time for people to actually know where their loved ones were. They didn't know if they were dead. They didn't know if they were alive. 
Not even because so many lifeboats seemed remained empty as the ship sank. Now that was a tragedy. That was sad. There could have been more people saved. But even that was a tragedy. But that was not the greatest tragedy. Not even because there were not enough lifeboats. Yes, that's a tragedy, but that's not the greatest. It was a tragedy because it could have been prevented. That's the greatest tragedy. Paul's warning is you can avoid a shipwreck in your life also if you do what is necessary for the Lord to lead your life. Paul's choice of the word shipwreck is important. A shipwreck is a terrifying experience. If you've ever encountered a shipwreck experience in your life, spiritually, it's scary. It's terrifying, especially if you go through a traumatic time to where you think there's no way out. But there's always a way out. God is always ready to bring us back to where we need to be. Bob Ballard, the one that actually discovered the Titanic all those years later in the 1980s. The scientist who discovered the Titanic wreckage two and a half miles below the surface of the water, said this, What began as merely scientific as archaeology became as real and as terrifying to me as though I had been on that ship myself. Now recently they just had some footage that was revealed that no one had ever seen before of when the actual submarine vessel, it's amazing they were able to take something down that depth. That's, that's a long ways to go. Something happens. I wouldn't want to be in that little bubble because <laughs> if you're in that bubble and something happens, you better be prepared to meet Jesus. All right, That's a long way down. But as he was down there inside that vessel, they had a picture, a camera, where they had got on the sonar screen where they discovered that they found the actual ship and as it raised down to the surface and you saw the actual stern of the ship for the very first time. It really, I'd never seen it before. It was like I had little pimples on the back of my neck. I thought, wow, could you imagine being in there? The first time a light had been shined on the Titanic vessel all those years. Those words make sense of what he was talking about there. But there are some powerful lessons for us when we think about the maiden voyage of sorts ourselves, the voyage of life. We think about the maiden voyage of the Titanic, how important that was, how important it was for the culture during that time period. But the same mistakes that were made by the people that were on that ship we're going to look at here in just a moment and assumptions that were made that sank the Titanic can also spiritually sink us as well. The mistakes that are made. The assumptions that we just think and say to ourselves, it's okay. It's okay for me to be living like this. It's okay for me to make those choices. But is it really? Is it honoring to God? Because if it's not, you're going to find yourself in a spiritual shipwreck. And I'd like for us to look at three things that led to the sinking of the Titanic, and I think can also lead to our sinking as well, if we're not careful. First of all, is the lust of pride. Proverbs 16, 18 says this, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. The infamous quote that was talked about by many people as this ship was being built, and as people were boarding, People were going all over the place talking about, we've read, we've heard the builders say, not even God Himself can sink this ship. That's how infallible, that's how strong they thought this vessel was. Captain Smith actually said this, Why, he declared, either of these vessels, referring also to the sister ship Olympic, could be cut in halves and each half would remain afloat indefinitely. The non-sinkable vessel has been reached in these two wonderful crafts. Once again, he was overheard at dinner on the faithful cruise increasing his claim to even if this ship be cut into three parts, 
Each part would still be afloat. That's how much he believed that this vessel could not sink. I venture to add, he said at another time, that even if the engines and boilers of these vessels were to fall through their bottoms, the vessels would remain afloat. In famous quotes that were made there. Also, its name conveys the spirit of pride. Listen to this editorial in the Belfast Morning News, June the 1st, 1911. It is difficult to understand why the owners and builders named this ship after the Titans. The Titans were a mythological race who thought they achieved power and learning greater than God, Zeus himself. To their ultimate ruin, he smote the strong and arrogant Titans with thunderbolts and their final abiding place was in some limbo beneath the lowest depths of the Tartus, a sunless abyss below Hades. This was written almost a year before this actually occurred. When Wade authored a book entitled The Titanic, he wrote, The Titanic was the incarnation of man's arrogance in acquainting size with security. Now, let's turn to the Scriptures and see what God says about pride. The Bible tells us there are six things doth the Lord hate. Proverbs 6.17 tells us God hates a proud look. The pride that cometh from that. But also we see in James 4.6, God resisteth the proud but giveth grace unto the humble. You know, it's scary for us to get prideful. It's scary for us to get prideful in our life and think that we've got all the answers. We've got everything figured out. Because that's where you can end up in a shipwreck. I'm reminded of a story where Ronald Reagan was giving a speech in Mexico City to a diversity of people. And as he spoke, he heard applause. Some people looked with different looks on their faces. He was just really just ashamed and upset at what the response was to his speech. But as he sat down, a representative from Mexico City stood up and began to speak in Spanish. And two, the speaking in Spanish, the applause got louder. The people just really got excited. Well, Ronald Reagan didn't know Spanish, so he thought in order to keep himself from being embarrassed, he would just applaud. He thought, they're clapping, maybe I should too. Well, the ambassador, the person that was there with him, leaned over to Ronald and said, please don't do that. He's just interpreting what you just said. And he was clapping to his own speech unaware. You ever met some people that just think everything they say is the gospel, it's the truth. They don't have any type of error and they have everything figured out. I don't have everything figured out. And reality check for you today is you don't have everything figured out. That night, what led to the sinking was pride in the hearts of people. Wanting more. See, some sins are committed out of a sense of need. Lying, stealing, adultery. But when a person is proud, they don't need anything. They think, I've got it figured out. I've got everything that I need. Not God, not the Bible, not prayer, not church, not a gospel song. They think they are in need of nothing. And a prideful heart will lead you toward shipwreck. Pride never says, I'm sorry. You know, it's okay to tell someone you're sorry because we all make mistakes. We're all going to do things that upset someone else. It's okay to say, I'm sorry. It's okay to say, please forgive me if I've offended you. It's okay. It's okay. Pride never asks, Please pray for me. Pride is deadly to humility. Pride is the athlete who is good and tells everyone he is. Pride is the offended church member who allows petty disagreements to keep them from attending services. Pride is the root of racial hatred. Pride will sink you just like it sunk the Titanic to the bottom of the Atlantic. If you allow pride to rule you, it will sink you to the depths of the abyss. It will. And that's why we've got to be careful because the Bible tells us God despises, abhors 
a prideful individual. So first of all, we see what sunk the Titanic was pride. What can sink us is pride. Number two, what sunk the Titanic was the love of prosperity. 1 Timothy 6, 8 through 10 tells us, And having food and raiment, let us be there worth content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I've heard this misquoted so many different times. I've heard people have money in their hand and say, look at all this evil that's in my hand. No, it's not the evil you hold in your hand. It's the love that you have for it. That's the evil. Titanic was warned 12 times they needed to slow down and change course. Why were they going so fast? To exceed expectation. They thought if they got there quicker, the next journey, the next time that they were able to set sail for a different adventure, there would be more money. There would be more people. It would be more luxurious. J. Bruce Ismay, the president of the White Star Liner shipping line and owner of the Titanic, urged Captain E.J. Smith, who was one voyage away from retirement, to continue full speed ahead and stay the course. He said, don't you dare slow down, you stay the course. His reason was this, it will mean great monetary gain for the white star shipping industry if we make this trip in record time and arrive in New York ahead of schedule. One person said this, after everything had happened, For no greater ambition than the love of money and the greed of one man, 1,516 souls went to a watery grave because of the love of prosperity. Bible examples of those who perished because of the love of money, Achan and his wedge of gold, Balaam and his wages of unrighteousness, Gonzi and his two talents of silver received under false pretense. The rich young ruler departed from Jesus because of what? He had great possessions. Judas, in his reward of 30 pieces of silver for betraying Jesus. Ananias and Sapphira and their private plot to keep back funds, they said they had given to the Lord, and because of that, the Lord laid them on their backs dead. Bible Examples of those who perish because of the love of money. The same can happen for us as well. When we start loving money and we want more and more money and we'll do whatever is necessary to get that money and we love it so much, it can lead us down a path of spiritual shipwreck. See, there's some things that are not worth a profit. See, there's nothing wrong with having something. I've got nice things that I have in my possession and I value and I'm thankful for God that I do have them. There's nothing wrong with saving money either. We ought to put back money. We ought to take care of what God has allowed us to have in our possession. There's nothing wrong with owning something just as long as it does not own you. Did you hear that? It's okay with having stuff. Don't let it own you, however. When what you have owns you and it dictates your life, it controls you, it's time for you to get rid of it. See, the love of prosperity, that was what cost the Titanic on its maiden voyage. That's what sent all those lives to a watery grave and that will be also what causes us spiritual shipwreck. Titanic was called the millionaire's ride, the ship of dreams. But for many that night, into those early hours, it ended up not being a ship of dreams, but a ship of nightmares, as they had no way out. 
And the only way to go was into those icy waters that night. If you've ever been up to Pigeon Forge to that little exhibit, they have a great example of what the water felt like that night with your hand being in that water. If you were in that water for longer than a minute or two, you probably were going into shock because of the coldness. You didn't have long to live unless someone pulled you into a lifeboat. But the thing that you were fighting against was that the people in the lifeboat didn't want to go back. You know what I think about when I hear that? I heard a pastor many years ago share this. This is actually added here. It just came to my heart. He said the Titanic that night was, was sinking. People screaming. There's been testimonies I've heard of actual people that have been recorded. They said it was so just eerie to hear the screams of the people on the Titanic that were still on board as this great ship. It, start, it went so far up in the air. And the only thing they could do was hang on or go into the water. But even in the water, they were still screaming. And he said, just think about this just for a moment. Those lifeboats, which were partially empty. There was, there was a lot of room that was possibly left in those lifeboats. He said, it's a lot of times like the people of the world today that are lost. That may not be screaming with their mouths, but they're needing somebody to tell the truth and go tell them that they need to be saved. But we won't. You know why? It's because we're in our lifeboats. We're safe. And we don't want anybody else inside. And that's the truth. He was saying that. And it really just broke to me. It spoke to my heart. And he said, we won't go back because we're comfortable where we are. But we need to get out of our comfort areas. We need to get out of our comfort zone and tell people about Jesus. Because people every day are dying and going to hell. And we need to tell them the truth. People say, well, if I tell somebody the truth, I'm going to offend them. Would you rather them go to hell or would you rather just offend them and they know the truth? We need to tell people about the truth of the gospel. But the love of prosperity is also what did it. And then thirdly, lastly, is this. The lie of presumption. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest... He fall. Now the following quote is from a sermon that was preached by the Bishop of Winchester, St. Mary's Church, Southampton, on the Sunday following the sinking of the Titanic. The Titanic, name and thing, will stand for a monument and a warning to human presumption. Boys, isn't that true? The lie of presumption, what did it lead to? A false sense of security. They thought the ship was unsinkable. When people stepped their feet upon that ship, they had no little inkling of a thought that the ship could actually sink. There were nine decks on the Titanic. Below the top, the most boat deck were decks A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Below G deck were the boiler rooms and holds. The hull was divided into 16 watertight compartments by means of 15 tight walkheads extending up through F deck. Heavy watertight doors provided communication between bulkheads during normal operation. These were electrically operated and also had a flotation mechanism for automatic closing in case water were to come in. The Titanic was presumed to be able to remain afloat with any two compartments flooded, possibly three, enabling her to withstand a collision at the joint of two compartments. There was no other ship that had ever given her passengers more confidence. There was no ship that had ever made her passengers feel more secure. It was a false sense of security. Then we see the presumptuous attitudes. Not enough lifeboats. They thought this ship could never sink. It would clutter the decks. It's been quoted by any individuals that was there upon that ship to make it look better. A great portion of the passengers were drinking, dancing, gambling, and having a great time, unaware that the ship would soon sink. A group of gamblers went on deck to look around and return to their cards. To sink with the ship. It still didn't set in. They didn't think it happened. Even after they were warned, many went on to bed with confidence in the Titanic's ability to stay afloat. 
Others joked about the life preservers, with some actually putting the life belts on and dancing around the deck, with others that stood back and laughed as they had their preservers on because they still could not believe that this ship would sink. Some were urged to get in to the boats and they said, why should we get into the boats and go out in this cold night when we'll be coming back in board just in a few moments? Others didn't want to put the life preservers on because they didn't want to get dirty and mess up their evening gowns. Many of them laughed when the porters and stewards tried to warn them that the ship was going to go down. Someone asked millionaire John Jacob Asker, Man, where is your belt? Mr. Asker replied, I don't think that I actually need that. I'm reminded of a story. The boxer, professional boxer, the greatest of all time. You know who that is, right? Muhammad Ali. He claims that. Well, once he was in an airplane. And while he was up there in that airplane, he was flying with a bunch of other people. And they said, ladies and gentlemen, we're finding some turbulence in the air here. He said, you need to put on what you need and you need to put on what you need so you'll be safe. And they were thinking, we may crash, so he had to put on this jacket that everybody else was, just in case something were to happen. And he looked at the person there standing and said, I'm Superman. He said, I don't need no parachute. I don't need any of this funny business. The person looked back at him and said, too, well, Superman don't need no parachute either. You think you need to sit down. <laughs> but many today have a false security based on their good works, their church membership, their baptism, etc. But at the great white throne, they will stand before God and the question will be, what did you do with Jesus? And they will say, I don't think that I need him. Like that night where they said they didn't need their preservers. They didn't need those things. But it was a lie, of presumption. They believed in something that they were told that could not sink. But many today have that false sense of security as well and things of this world that think that they'll never die. They'll never go away. But the fact of the matter is there's only one thing that will never fail you and that's Jesus. He's the only thing that will keep you secure. With that being said, in closing I'll say this. The conclusion, the unthinkable could have saved the unsinkable. There's been many ideas, many different philosophies on the Titanic. The most amazing fact of this tragedy to me is that the watertight seals that were designed to make the Titanic unsinkable actually sank it. It was a flaw. Twelve square feet were cut open to the deep. However, after the first five watertight compartments filled, the bow began to sink into the water. The opening through which the anchor chains are lowered were underwater, adding 12 more square feet that just expedited this. Doubling the rate of water that came up on, soon cargo bay doors and windows would dug below the surface and add hundreds of more square feet to the sea. Ironically, many have studied this, many that have been down to the wreckage, many have studied the building of the Titanic. If the watertight doors had been opened, instead of closed, or simply did not exist, the boat would have sank at an even keel with only 12 square feet open to the sea for at least 8 to 12 hours, which would have what? Allowed the rescue boat to be there and everybody could have been saved. Obviously, it would have seemed unsink unthinkable to anyone to open the watertight doors. Unthinkable. They thought this watertight door compartment would save us. And even if someone did that or tried to do it, they probably would have been arrested or they would have been told that you are foolish as it would have seemed illogical. But think about this when we think about illogical things. Are we willing to do what is seemingly illogical if God commands it? Proverbs 14, 12 tells us, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There's things that seem right to people today of what to do, but the only thing that is going to be good for you, the only thing that is going to be secure for you, is to trust in Jesus. 
That's the only thing. See, religion says you must work your way to heaven. Nothing is free. God says what in Philippians, or excuse me, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, religion says do. Jesus says done. Jesus, with what he did upon the cross, it was sufficient for all things. His blood covers all sins, past, present, and future. And we are all on a journey with God. And Satan's plan is to shipwreck our lives. And if you're not careful, your lives will be laying just like the Titanic is laying on the bottom of the Atlantic right now. And many believe that in the next 50 years, the Titanic will no longer resemble a ship anymore. It's just going to continue to waste away until it's not there anymore. And Satan wants to destroy your life. He wants to shipwreck your lives. And you know how he does that? With just what I've talked about with you today. Pride, the love of money, and presumptuous attitudes toward thinking that I'm okay and that I'm going to be okay with living my life exactly the way that it is. The final warning, then I'll pray. By the way, I, I really love the Titanic. I, I've studied it a lot. You probably can tell I love it. I, I've studied it. I've looked at everything. I like to watch documentaries on it. It's sad, but it could have been avoided. A final warning. Moody Memorial Church had called a new senior pastor from Scotton who was on the Titanic and so never made it to America. He never made it. According to survivors, he led several people to Christ before the ship went down. There were all types of people on board that ship. We know that. The rich, the poor, the famous, unknown, royalty, stewage, passengers, crew. But in the end, all that mattered, from the person who had the millions down to the people that only had a couple of coins left in their pocket, all that mattered was two lists when published in every newspaper article, the saved and the lost. That's what it all boiled down to. And the same will be true in heaven. It doesn't matter how much you have. It doesn't matter what you've tried to do. The same list is all that's going to matter in heaven. The ones that trusted in Jesus and the ones who have not that will depart because I never knew you. That pastor may have been on the lost list in the newspaper when they finally were able to identify all those bodies. He may have been on the lost in the paper that day, but in heaven, his name was found on the saved list. He met his master that night. But the question for you is, what list are you on? Because one day that's all that's going to matter is whether we're saved and we've trusted in Jesus or whether we haven't. Amen. I know it was a little different this morning, but Titanic this weekend, and there's a lot of truth that comes from that. And I pray this has been a blessing to you. If you would, let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your wonderful truth. I pray this morning if someone is on the danger of being shipwrecked spiritually, I pray that they'd come to you. Allow you to guide their lives, Father God. They'd take their hands up off that helm of the ship. And Father God, they'd allow you to steer in the direction. I've heard people say before God that we need you as our co-pilot. Well, if you're our co-pilot, we need to be swapping seats. You need to be driver. and You need to be in control of our life, guiding us to where we need to be. Father, also this morning, if there's someone that's not saved, I pray today that today would be the salvation for whoever that might be. We love you, we praise you, we thank you once again for all you do. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you would stand together. i
Just we'll sing one more verse. If no one comes, we'll close. Thank you so much for being attentive today, and uh, if you didn't get anything else from this, I pray that you, you know that Jesus loves you, and that he died for you, and that he wants you to be one of his if you have not trusted him yet, and, and also I hope you might have gained some information on the Titanic maybe, I'm just kidding, <laughs> but um, uh, just good to reflect off that and see stories that we see over history, mistakes. And things that happen. And if we're not careful, we can make the same ones in our lives spiritually. Amen. Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. And just remember, for if you are a parent or a guardian of a 5th grader that's going into 6th grade, or if you have an 11th grader going into 12th grade, I'd like to meet with you just for a few moments. Uh, we're going to talk about some things with the youth. So uh, please stick around. And... Um, I will not be at the back shaking hands and saying hello or, or goodbye if I haven't got to talk to you yet today. But just pray you have a wonderful day. Pray you have a safe day. And uh, we'll see you Wednesday night. All right, let's go ahead and let's pray. And Charlie, I'm going to ask you to pray for us.